Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Do you know the difference between a secret and a mystery? A question I read in a book that I was reading a couple years ago. The book is called Grace Upon Grace. It's a really great book. And that question really kind of pulled me up short. Do you know the difference between a secret and a mystery? And I really liked the answer. Once a secret is told, it ceases to be a secret. A mystery, however, remains a mystery even after it is spoken. Isn't that great? And that had a profound impact on my understanding of some of the things that we believe that are mysteries. After all, our faith really is highlighted by many mysteries which we don't fully understand, nor can we adequately explain. Right? Today is Holy Trinity Sunday. Can any of you explain how the Holy Trinity works? And yet, we confess it as truth because we believe. Today, in our readings and in our celebration and worship, we're highlighting some of the main aspects of our faith Yet they're all mysteries. The Trinity, a mystery. Baptism from our gospel reading, being born again as a new child of God through baptism, a mystery. Celebrating our Lord's Supper by eating his body and blood and receiving forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, a mystery. And you can see this in the words that we try to use in order to sort of explain what's happening, but of course they all fall short. That's why the Athanasian Creed is like two pages long. Because we're trying to use human words to describe something that is beyond humanity. Something that is beyond creation. So dear friends in Christ, those who sit here in faith, you are a believer in mysteries. The mysteries of God that you believe in faith. So let's take a look at those few mysteries this morning. There are, of course, more than the three we're going to highlight today. But these are enough to get us talking about the proper understanding of how we view these mysteries. Not necessarily as problems or riddles to be solved, but opportunities to believe in God and what he has done for us in Jesus and by the grace of the Holy Spirit. So to start our discussion of the Christian mysteries, we have to really talk about the concept of faith. After all, in our theology, that's what we confess is a gift from God that allows us to confess faith in these very mysteries we speak of. And the Bible gives us a nice definition of what faith is. From Hebrews chapter 11, faith is defined as the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. A great definition, because by definition, faith calls us to adhere to things, to confess things as true that we ourselves don't fully understand. We can't see it all. We don't have a vision wide enough or grand enough to understand the workings of our God. And for one in faith, that's quite a comfort, I think. If you've ever taken any sort of philosophy courses, one of the things that usually comes up about God is asking questions about whether or not his creatures can fully comprehend him. And if that's the case, he's not really much of a God. If we can grasp him in his totality. Now the reality is that in faith we understand that most of what we know about God he has revealed to us himself. For he is far beyond our understanding. And it's only by his grace and mercy that he comes into our world and into our lives in manners by which we can see him, at least in part. And that's what we're talking about today. Today is Holy Trinity Sunday. We focus on the worship and teaching of our triune God. That's why we're confessing the Athanasian Creed to express and confess this truth about our faith. And you've probably heard many different analogies to explain the concept of the Trinity. 
right? How many of you have heard the apple analogy, right? You have the skin of the apple, the flesh of the apple, and the seed of the apple, yet they're all the apple, right? Because our teaching on the Trinity is that we've got the three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet they are one in their substance, united as one God. And then, of course, the natural question to that statement is, how? And now you know it's a mystery. Or I've also heard water explained, right? So water can be a gas, it can be a solid when it's frozen, and it can be a liquid. Yet they're all water. And these serve, I think, some purpose in helping us sort of get to the beginning of the concept of the Trinity. But they, of course, all fall short, just like the Athanasian Creed. So don't expect today, after you've said the Athanasian Creed, that you're going to leave thinking, the Trinity, I got it, I figured it out. Because that's actually not the purpose. The purpose is our confession of faith in something we don't understand. Yet we still believe it to be true. Just like those analogies, all human words fall short. And I think that's actually an intentional thing on the part of God. And we'll get to that in a moment. The second one is in our gospel reading today. Jesus is describing the reality of how baptism works to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, they go out of their way in the text to describe us so that we know he's no slouch. Nicodemus is a teacher, a leader of the people of God in Israel. He knows his stuff. He's not a dummy. And yet when Jesus tells him that he must be born again, Nicodemus is incredulous. He doesn't understand. How is that possible? How does that work? And notice that Jesus doesn't really explain how it works. He just says what it does. That unless one is born of water and the Spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. And what is born of Spirit is Spirit, and what is born of flesh is flesh. There's never a point in our gospel reading where Nicodemus says, Ah, I get it. We don't understand how baptism works. We believe that baptism does make us into a new creation, formerly dead in our trespasses and sins, and now a new child of God by the word of God and water. How does that work? Right? I always love the story of Naaman the leper in 2 Kings in the Old Testament. Because he has like the perfect human response to the idea of going and washing yourself in water and being cleaned of something that you wouldn't expect water to do anything for. So if you're familiar with the story, Naaman the leper, he's a big name in Syria, but of course he's a leper and so he suffers from this terrible disease that's incurable. And he's told to go see the prophet of God in Judea. And so he goes and sees him, and he's expecting, get this, which is sort of funny, he was sort of expecting the prophet of God to wave his arms over his body and say some words. And instead, the prophet of God doesn't even meet with him, but sends one of his servants and instructs Naaman to go wash himself in the Jordan River. And what is Naaman's response? His response is very human. He says, well, you could have told me that back in Syria. The Jordan's not very great. The water's gross. We have much better rivers back home. This isn't going to work, right? Because it's weird to say that water from a river is going to do something as incredible as cleanse him of his leprosy. The mystery and the power of God's word. That's what we believe in in baptism. That even though it does this incredible thing because God's word and promise is behind it, even though we don't understand how it works, that it does make you into a new creation. It does wash away your sin and put God's name on you and you become a child of God. And our third is the sacrament of the altar or the Lord's Supper, which we'll be celebrating today. Communion is a wonderful gift for those in faith and by it, What's actually going on when we consume the body and blood of Jesus, which we believe to be really present in this meal, is that we're participating in the flesh and blood sacrifice of Jesus and proclaiming the gospel reality that it entails. How does that work? 
Can you explain that to me? Luther uses the words in, with, and under to describe the union of the bread and wine and the body and blood, which is really just a way of saying it's there, but I don't know how. It's not literal, obviously. It's not like we stuff bits of flesh in the, in the baking of the bread or hide it under, literally underneath it. We have no idea how that union works, but we believe that it is there because the word of our God says so. And by the gracious gift of faith, we believe. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, obviously, these aren't fringe beliefs of our faith. They're pretty central to the core understanding of our relationship with God and his plan of salvation in Jesus. So why all the mystery? Why doesn't God just fully explain it to us all so we don't have to deal with these what-if questions or how does that work or deal with the doubts of whether or not what I'm really witnessing is doing what God says it's doing? It's a pretty reasonable human question to ask. Why did God leave so much mystery about faith? Well, there's numerous reasons, but I think the main one from Scripture that we glean is that he desires a faith-based, a trusting relationship with us. A relationship based on faith in Him. And that little word in is significant. Think about when we say our creed. We don't say, I believe about God the Father. We don't say, I believe God the Father, like we believe what He's telling us. We say, I believe in God the Father, in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit. And that's a significant, even though that's a tiny word, it's a significant significant word. See, God's goal with our faith isn't a complete understanding of all he's about. I like to think that it would probably turn out poorly for us if he did. That would overload our brain. We're not meant to know. Either by the fact that we wouldn't be able to grasp it even if explained, or it would be bad for us to know, and that's why he hasn't told us. So his goal isn't our full understanding of what he's about, what he's doing to us, for us, and others. Rather, it is our full faith in him to do all these things that we don't understand. All these mysteries that are necessary in order to take you and me, sinners dead in their trespasses and sins, not even looking for a savior, and turn us into forgiven, perfect children of God. I mean, think about that for a moment. Have you ever had days or weeks where you just are struck by that thought? Like, how is it that God did that for me? You know, all these other people around me, they don't really know all the stuff that I think about, but I do. How could God love me? And yet he does. We just read the great gospel in a nutshell verse. I'm going to read it again. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's sort of the underlying mystery under all these little mysteries is that God would even do all this for you and me in the first place. But thanks be to God and Jesus that he does. Well, and if you start to think that this is sort of a strange aspect of being a human that doesn't apply to anywhere else other than your Christian faith, consider these examples. Think about when you were five or six years old and your parents wanted you to do something and you thought, no, why am I doing that? That seems dumb. Why did you say that? Maybe... Sometimes it's just to be mean to your parents and talk back, right? Children are sinners just like adults. But often I think it's because you didn't really understand why your parents were asking you to do the thing they were asking you to do. And parents out there, you know this to be true, right? You have a broader vision of life and what to expect than your children. And so sometimes the things that you ask them to do, you understand why and the importance of it, but they do not. And so it is with us as children of our Heavenly Father. And so often we trust in our parents when they do or say things or get us to do things that we don't fully understand. Not because we grasp exactly why they're asking, but because the who 
of who's doing the asking is someone that we believe in, someone that we trust in. And so it is with us and our Heavenly Father. And this isn't something that non-believers don't grasp in some form or fashion. They do. Think about every single movie scene or TV show scene where you have that great challenge in front of you and somebody looks at another character and says, do you trust me? That question always predicates, it always precedes some activity they're going to do that isn't going to make any sense to the person, yet they're going to participate in it or go along with it because they trust the person who's asking that question. So it is with our life of faith. Yeah, yeah, there are going to be things that happen in your life that you're not going to understand. Why did God allow this to happen to me or my friend or my loved one? Why, how does does communion work? Explain the Trinity to me. Why can't I know these things? And we get the same response that Job got when he asked all those questions. Which is, God displays his knowledge and majesty and says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? In other words, I'm God. Trust in me. So now what? If mystery is so prevalent in our faith, how can I hope to fulfill the mission that God has given the church? How can I hope to explain all of this stuff to somebody else so that they believe it too? I can't explain it to them. So how does that work? Well, the short answer is you don't explain it to them. You proclaim it to them. I had this epiphany moment when I was in college. I used to like to get in debates with people about theology and the big questions of life. And part of the reason for that was I had a sense of self-importance that didn't really belong. And it really hammered home for me. I don't remember exactly what I was studying or reading, but the idea that the Bible has been around for two millennia in some form or fashion. And here I am, Adam Thompson, in 2009, talking with somebody on a campus that hasn't even existed for 100 years, and I'm the defender of the Bible. Dear friends in Christ, the Bible speaks for itself doesn't need you or me to protect it. It's going to be around a lot longer than we are. And the Bible teaches us what it does. In Romans 1.17 it says that the word of God is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. So in, in our Lutheran confession, our understanding of evangelism isn't that we go out and explain the work of God to people. It's that we proclaim it to them understanding that faith is only created by God through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Precisely because so many of the things that we believe, we don't fully understand. But we believe them to be true because we believe in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we trust that when we go out and proclaim this word of God, it will create faith in those in whom God wills it to be. That the heavy lifting of evangelism is the work of the Holy Spirit, We can't do that. Now, explanation isn't useless. However, explanation is almost always for the sake of the believer. Because explanation doesn't create faith. Let me give you an example. Just before, I proclaimed forgiveness to you. And that's a function not of Adam Thompson, but a function of the office of the pastor in the church of God. And I always say, right, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. That's a proclamation of forgiveness because it's applying God's word to you directly. An explanation of God's forgiveness would be something like me telling you about this guy named Jesus that lived a long time ago and that he died on a cross to save the sins of the world. Still a good thing to talk about, but what's missing there is Your question might be, well, what does that have to do with me? Because nobody's proclaiming those words to you. And that's what we ought to do. So, my fellow Trinitarian baptized believers, sustained through the gifts 
of Jesus' body and blood. Proclaim the mighty and mysterious works of our God. To the unbelievers that God places in your life, at home, at work, and in your community, so they too may receive the gracious gift of faith and join us in our faith in God and the belief in the wondrous mystery of the salvation that he has won for us in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in this very word and promise of Christ Jesus our Lord until he comes again to make all things new. Amen.